Before the Kardashians, before Survivor, the Osbournes, the Real Housewives, and The Bachelor, there was this. This is the true story. True story. Seven strangers <laughs> picked to live in a loft and have their lives taped. The real world. It was simple and yet like nothing we'd ever seen before. Take a group of 20-somethings from different backgrounds with varied interests and throw them together to, well... To find out what happens... <laughs> what? When people stop being polite. Could you get the phone? And start getting real. The real world. The person responsible for inventing the real world is Jonathan Murray. I guess known to a lot of people as the creator of The Real World, one of the first reality TV shows... Some people call me the grandfather of reality TV, which I don't like. <laughs> you can thank John Murray and his business partner, Mary Ellis Bunim, for shows like The Kardashians, Total Divas, Project Runway, and The Real World. The pair created an entirely new genre of TV. And they did it by accident. This is The Venture, a branded podcast from Virgin Atlantic and Gimlet Creative about pioneering businesses and the people who made them possible. Each week, we're meeting innovators, artists, and risk takers who prove that business is an adventure. I'm your host, Ashley Miltite. We're taking this journey alongside Virgin Atlantic, Richard Branson's transatlantic airline, a company that embodies the entrepreneurial spirit and celebrates challenging the status quo. from uh, Real World, the first season. Oh. And there I am. There's Eric, Becky, Norm. But yeah, this was when we shot a little reunion just before we started season two. And I meet John at his production office in Glendale, California. It's spacious with a seating area and a long corner desk. There's a lovely view of the LA Hills. The walls are covered with framed posters of John's shows. The Simple Life with Paris Hilton, an A&E show called Born This Way about people living with Down syndrome. And there are pictures everywhere of former real-world cast members, attractive 20-somethings, hugging each other and smiling at the camera. I point one out. Ooh. Oh, there he is. Yes, there's Puck in the corner. Yeah, and interesting enough, he's with Norm. But I really love this picture because, you know, here it is, Norm, the gay guy from season one, and Puck, the, the bike messenger who got into a battle with Pedro from season three, and here they are together. These are the real people John made famous, at least for a little while. He's also responsible for introducing mainstream America to names like Paris Hilton and Kim Kardashian. Bunim Murray makes a little show called Keeping Up with the Kardashians, currently in its 13th season. Had I jumped the shark? Do you mean the ship? It says shark. Why would you even be on uh, a shark? And we were riding a shark. <laughs> John grew up in Syracuse, New York, and always knew he wanted to work in TV. As a teenager, he was a fan of Michael Apted's Up series, also known as Seven Up, a British documentary series that filmed the same group of children every seven years. He also loved An American Family, a PBS show from the 1970s that documented the lives of an upper-middle-class family named The Louds. When John graduated from college, he bounced around a few news stations, eventually landing at WOKR-TV in Rochester, New York. And that's where he conducted his very first experiments in what would become reality television. Some of the projects that I had done in local television news were very much observational, moving myself and a reporter into a public housing complex to document what life was like. Those kinds of things have always been interesting to me. I'm, I always like to capture sort of life and find the meaning in what was going on there. After a few years in local news, John moved to New York and started writing a fiction series, a scripted drama he called Crime Diaries. He got a TV agent to help find a network to produce it. That's how he met his longtime business partner, Mary Alice Bunim. And my agent at William Morris, Mark Itkin, put me together with Mary Alice to develop it. We made a pilot, ended up not going forward, but Mary Alice and I immediately clicked. This was in 1987. Mary Alice Bunim was an executive producer of daytime soap operas. She and John liked and admired each other's skills, and they were both interested in something neither of them had seen on TV before. They wanted to blend documentary with drama. Plus, as John said, 
they just clicked. Mary Ellis was a tough businesswoman. Um, she had grown up at a time where, quite honestly, women were discounted in business. And so there, there was an edge and there was a no-nonsense quality about her, which I really appreciated. And, you know, for years in news, I had always surrounded myself with really strong women. I love strong women. Uh, you know, maybe it's because I'm a gay man. I don't know what it is. But because she sensed how much I respected her, I think with me, she could, she could relax and just be herself and take off a little of her armor. That year, John and Mary Alice started Bune and Murray Productions. As business partners, they played to each other's strengths and weaknesses. When we would go in to fight something out with, you know, our agency over a deal, boy, she knew how to arm up and, and fight for what we needed. I would usually be able to sort of read the room really well and know when we needed to pull back so I could just put my hand on, you know, her arm or her knee, and she would know that, oh, okay, I'm getting a little too too aggressive here, and then I would smooth it out. Mary Alice and John were business partners for nearly 20 years. She died in 2004. In the late 80s, TV was all about family sitcoms like The Cosby Show and Roseanne, the docudramas that John and Mary Ellis were interested in making were a hard sell. One night, they went to dinner with a friend of theirs, a showrunner and director named George Vashaw. He brought a fourth guest to dinner, Delilah Loud. Delilah and her family were the subjects of An American Family, the documentary series John had loved when he was young. Here's George Vashaw. Delilah was sitting there at dinner with us, and I'll never forget the dinner, and she was saying, oh yeah, and the cameras followed us for six months, and it was crazy, my brother came out, and, you know, drug issues, my parents divorced, and, and all this made this classic documentary about their family. John and Mary Alice and I were looking at each other and going, ding, ding, light bulbs going off, you know, like this is the next thing in television. Trouble was, no one else agreed. John and Mary Alice's young company was flailing. I cashed in a lot of IRAs. Uh, you know, um, I was driving a 10-year-old Honda Accord breaking down at every key intersection in Los Angeles. Um, Mary Ellis ultimately took a job running Loving, the soap in New York, because she had a husband and a child to, you know, to contribute income to. So, so it, was, it was challenging. Then one day, in October of 1990, a show about a group of teenagers in Beverly Hills debuted on Fox. You know, you're trying to make me jealous, Dylan. It won't work. Hey, you're the one who broke up with me, all right? Don't you ever forget it. So how long has this been going on with you two? Since about 6.30. It was called Beverly Hills 90210, and young people loved it. This was the audience that a newish network called MTV was going after. At that time, MTV was about a decade old and ready to branch out from just airing music videos. MTV had a project in mind and gave John and Mary Ellis a call. We were working with MTV on a scripted idea called St. Mark's Place about a group of young people starting out their lives in New York. But as it turned out, MTV didn't have the budget to hire actors and writers. So John and Mary Alice came up with another idea. What if cameras followed real people, young people, as they went about their lives? The show wouldn't need actors or writers. It would be way cheaper to produce. So we pitched that idea to Lauren Correo at MTV uh, at the Mayflower Hotel on Central Park West at breakfast. And by lunch, um, she called back to say that her boss loved the idea and let's do a pilot. George Vashur directed the first season of The Real World. We went to New York and, you know, had to figure out just how do you turn real life into a soap opera? How do you film 60 hours a week and pare it down to 23 minutes? At that time, no one had ever attempted it. MTV gave John and Mary Ellis a tiny budget to shoot the pilot, but they had a vision for how to make it work. We had to have this diversity of... Of, from socioeconomic standpoint, from uh, racial standpoint, from uh, sexual orientation. We knew that that was going to create the energy for the show. 
John and Mary Ellis put out casting calls on the radio, put flyers up around New York City, and reached out to music clubs and modelling agencies looking for cast members. John remembers one young woman in particular from Birmingham, Alabama, Julie Oliver. You know, I was aching to be in a city. I wanted to be with other people. You know, I wanted to experience some other things. And yes, he definitely picked up on that. She wanted to be a dancer, and she dreamed of going to New York. And I just really felt that that's the person we need to really open this series up to all of our viewers, who in very much ways are probably like Julie, you know, all around the country, who New York is just a dream, or New York is this fantasy land that they hadn't experienced. MTV flew Julie to New York a month later, cameras rolling. The plan was for her to arrive at the real-world loft in a yellow cab. I'd had this amazing cab driver once take me to JFK. You can't move. It's bumper to bumper. There's 4,000 people trying to get into your cab. And, and you so I had kept his number and name. And so I had him pick up Julie. This was John producing reality. It was a brand new kind of television, and it was mesmerizing. If this is your first time in New York. There's criminals all over the place. It's a shame. It's, it's a nuisance. I mean, I didn't hail that cab and get you know, that really talkative, animated cab driver, did I? So that was set up. That's why this is reality TV and not a documentary, because he was great. And I had him take her to Soho via Harlem, (laughs) which is not a good way to go. Uh, It's an expensive way to go. But I wanted to really take her through. You know, 1992, New York was not quite as, as pretty as it is today. So I wanted her to sort of see some of the dilapidation of New York before she came into Soho. Not only was reality heightened, it also had a soundtrack. It was a perfect marriage of music and TV. This was MTV after all. Here's the director, George. I mean, one of the biggest things that people forget is on season one of Real World, we had the entire MTV music library we could use. That's gigantic. I mean, we could use R.E.M., Guns N' Roses, Peter Gabriel, any music we wanted, we could put that on top of this footage of real life and suddenly it elevated it to cinematic level. And it changed everything. You know, every, suddenly everyone at home was going, look at that. Regular people are movie stars. This kind of manipulation, casting the cab driver, telling him what route to drive, adding a soundtrack to real life, these are the bright red lines between documentary and reality TV. With reality, you're often creating a contrivance, but you're still interested in getting at the truth. So real world, we put seven individuals who would not normally live together. But out of that experience come many real things that are very relatable and very truthful. MTV picked up the pilot. And over a long weekend in the winter of 1992, all seven cast members moved into the loft on the corner of Prince and Broadway in Soho. Their new home for the next three months was spacious, modern, and came equipped with a team of young producers lugging around cameras, battery packs, and cables. Um, my first roommate walked in, and her name was Becky. Hi. Just, just walk around. And this is where we live. And I tell you, the moment those people walked in, oh my God, and started sort of bouncing off each other, we knew there was something really exciting about what we had come up with. Coming up, John and Mary Ellis had convinced MTV to make a soap opera starring real people. But what if nothing happened? And the reality show villain is born. If she continues to call me an ass, I feel almost obligated to be an ass. It's kind of how I am, you know, I am the puck. You're listening to The Venture, brought to you by the transatlantic airline Virgin Atlantic. If you put someone in a focus group and ask them what they like to eat, they'll say something totally different to actually if you watch them eat without being observed. Mark Murphy is the food and beverage manager for Virgin Atlantic's airport clubhouses globally. 
And much as John Murray approaches casting for the real world, zeroing in on what motivates people, who they are and what they want, Mark does something similar, observing Virgin Atlantic travellers out in the wild. I'll go and sit in the lounge and watch habits and just watch people and you, you can bet your bottom dollar that you ask someone what they eat when they get the chance to choose off a menu and they're going to tell you a quinoa salad. The reality is they'll have a burger and a beer. There's a, there's a comfort level that we try to create in our clubhouses that goes beyond the research and beyond what the trends tell us. Virgin Atlantic. They may just know what you want before you know you want it. To learn more, go to virginatlantic.com slash the venture. John Murray and Mary Alice Bunim had convinced MTV to make a soap opera starring real people. They'd begun shooting the first season of The Real World. But there was one big problem. What if nothing happened? For example, a cast member on season two, John Brennan, sat on the couch day after day drinking Kool-Aid. Here's the director, George Vashur. John and me also be screaming, going, we don't have an episode, i got to deliver something to MTV. And I said, well, then I'm going to tell the story of John Brennan doing nothing. Early on, John and Mary Ellis agreed to a sort of insurance policy with MTV. So we said, OK, if nothing happens, we will figure a way to throw a pebble in the pond to sort of create something. So we had a couple potential things. Eric Neese, who had been a model and was in that first season, had been in a book of male nudes. And so he said, well, we could put that in the house, in the bookshelf, and what would happen if someone pulled it out and saw it? That would create a ripple in the pond. But when John and Mary Ellis planted that book for the other roommates to find, it backfired. The cast members figured out what happened and got upset. Maris and I went in and basically owned up to what we had done, and we basically said, this is new to us, we're figuring this out, and we realize this is not the way to go. And we said to MTV, you'll just have to trust that we're going to get enough story, because if we do this kind of stuff, it's not going to work. Another thing the crew was figuring out was how to make sure they were around when things did happen, like the most dramatic moment that first season a fight between two cast members, Julie and Kevin. Black people cannot be racist. We don't have the power to control what people have. Get out of my face! I'm so sick of this! I was in with the crew on the way to Brooklyn to shoot something else, and then they called me and said, you got to get back here. These guys are exploding. I ran, rushed back, ran in with the cameras, and then we were getting the tail end of the fight. And I will never forget, we were throwing cable out the window on Princeton Broadway. The cameraman hooked back up so we could capture this argument, which, strangely enough, was happening during the L.A. riots. So here you have this black man and this white woman on the streets of New York in front of this loft with two cameras down there filming them as they're arguing about race. You call yourself you're a teacher? Old, yeah, white you call yourself Alabama. a teacher? You're a, white, you're a 19-year-old white girl from Alabama who just doesn't understand. It's not a black-white yes, it issue. Is. How? Yes, it is. How? Viewers had never seen anything like this play out on their screens. It was an unscripted fight on camera. It ended up being one of the most talked about episodes of that season. Today, the climactic fight is a mainstay in every reality TV show. You know it's coming, and that's part of why you watch. I'm going to bust you right in the mouth right now if you talk to me like that again. Just keep going. Prostitution whore, you are f***ing engaged 19 times. Shut the f*** up. Don't tell me to shut the f*** up. Seriously, I don't give a f- about anybody in this house. Okay. Hold my earrings, please. Oh, yeah, this is what's up. This is what's up. Back then, it was brand new, just like another trope of reality TV, the villain. I, I'm getting my own food, man. I'm buying my own peanut butter, and everybody else can kiss my butt. Puck on season three of The Real World was the provocateur, the character you hated but couldn't help watching. You can thank George for Puck. He was like this street urchin that I found in San Francisco. I'll never, I walked into this loft he was squatting in with like five other bike messengers up there. And I introduced him to Mary Ellis and one of the MTV executives and they were terrified. They said, George, you're out of your mind. This guy's, he's, and I said, exactly. This is what we need. John agreed to take a risk on Puck and it worked. The episode where Puck was kicked out of the house in San Francisco was a ratings high. With all the new viewers, John had a powerful platform, and he wanted to use it to make a difference. Despite all the contrivance, all the setup, there was something earnest and unchanging about the show. 
John's dedication to featuring people on the fringes. Here's John again. As a young gay man who grew up in a period where I didn't feel comfortable coming out in high school and college, I love the idea of creating a world where young people can feel comfortable with their sexuality. John's mission was to cast a gay person in every season, which he more or less was able to do. But remember, in the early 90s, The Real World was the first cable TV show to feature non-fictional gay characters living normal lives. I really think you can tie, you know, Real World starting in 92 through today with its positive portrayals of people who are gay and lesbian, um, people who are transgendered, um, with the way young people lead their lives today. They are the most open, the most tolerant. They embrace diversity. And I think Real World gets some of the credit for that. When I first found out I was actually part of it, I felt this immense amount of anger, and I didn't know what to do. Pedro Zamora was 22 years old, HIV positive and gay. AIDS was a big news story at the time, and misinformation was still swirling about how the disease was spread. But Pedro was someone audiences could relate to and empathize with. Through him, John could educate young people about AIDS and HIV. I did not get AIDS because I am gay. I got it because I had unprotected sex. Pedro got sicker during the filming of season three. He died of complications from AIDS in November 1994. Viewers were moved, including this guy. I'm really glad I got to know Pedro Zamora. President Bill Clinton released a statement that aired on MTV after Pedro died. I'm grateful that his rich and fulfilling work is still remembered today. And I hope you enjoy and learn from Pedro's life of compassion and fearlessness. Judd Winnick was also a cast member from season three. He became a close friend of Pedro's. Judd still lives in San Francisco and says he feels Pedro's legacy to this day. Honestly, yesterday, walking on the street, someone, you know, brushed by me and gave me the, oh, hey, I, can I, I'm sorry, can I ask you the stupidest question? And then they burst into tears. This was, uh, there was a man who was around my age who, uh, when we did the show, he was first coming out. And not long after that, he had tested positive and he had lost his partner. And the reason he was living in San Francisco was because he saw Pedro on The Real World. He said, I'm, I'm here right now talking to you because, because he was on television 20, 23 years ago. He is John. You know, it was just uh, an incredibly powerful experience for everybody who worked on that show, who was part of that crew, who was part of that cast. Because, you know, Pedro and his health became so much, something much, much bigger than the show itself. The Real World debuted on MTV in 1992. It had a huge impact on youth culture. Still, it took the American television industry years before it was willing to take the risk and try reality TV for mainstream audiences. It wasn't until 2000 that CBS came out with... Survivor. Here's LA Times TV critic Meredith Blake. There's the real world, and then, like, eight years later, you have Survivor, and then within quick succession you have American Idol, you have The Bachelor, and you have The Osbournes. And I think within those kind of five shows, you have the seeds of pretty much every reality show that's on television now. The real world created the framework for its successes. The villain, the confessional, the I'm not here to make friends mentality. It was all part of the universe John created. Tony DeSanto is a former president of programming at MTV and executive producer of another MTV reality show, Laguna Beach. He says he's always tried to make shows that are as innovative and groundbreaking as John's. John is brilliant at the casting and putting people together into a combustible Petri dish uh, uh, that then it's sort of like, let's see what happens. And the way, the way in scripted programming and films, it's all about the screenwriting. In reality TV, it, the screenwriting is the casting, and that's what John does so brilliantly. According to LA Times TV critic Meredith Blake, the real world didn't just change TV, it changed us. I think people are willing to say things and open up about their lives in a way that, I mean, why would you have done it before the real world? <laughs> you know, why would you have said, oh, you know, my parents got divorced and 
you know, my dad doesn't love me. And why would you, you know, why would you turn your own life into a narrative like that until um, reality TV became a thing? And of course, it changed our politics. We are living in a world with, you know, we have a reality show star as a president. And depending on your feelings about him, um, that's a good or a bad thing. But I think um, obviously it's, it's hugely influential. 25 years later, the real world is still in production, but now with a few tweaks. On a recent season, seven roommates moved into a house, and throughout the season, their exes moved in too. The real world remains MTV's longest-running show, and that business that John and Mary Ellis struggled to get off the ground is doing pretty well too. 30 years ago, after Mary Ellis and I started in this, you know, we, we rented a conference room from another company and we had an IBM Selectric typewriter and we had a phone machine and uh, it was just the two of us. And today, you know, we have this company with five or 600 employees and I've watched them start here as interns in college and now some of those interns are running shows like the Kardashians. Reality TV today is often thought of as a guilty pleasure, something you're embarrassed to admit watching, something that makes people famous for doing nothing. But for the people who invented it, it was groundbreaking. Here's George for sure. We all want to have some made a mark in the world and leave our, you know, some story behind. And before reality TV, people really didn't have much of a chance to do that. If you didn't make the, the newspaper, or you didn't somehow become a celebrity, you really had very few ways of leaving your mark or being witnessed, if you will. So reality suddenly gave this platform for people to step up and be witnessed and be heard and be relevant and be meaningful. And suddenly my life matters. And John Murray, the student of documentary and the godfather of reality TV, he's proud to have created a genre of television that's irresistible. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the crazy, harried world of sitting down and having fun watching a show where you don't have to work too hard at it. You know, it's a democracy television. And if people don't like something, then they'll stop watching it. The Venture is a co-production of Virgin Atlantic, Gimlet Creative, and Filio and Partners. This episode was produced by Julia Botero, Nicole Wong, and Rachel Ward, with help from Grant Irving, Francis Harlow, Caitlin Baguki, Abby Ruzika, and Caitlin Delena. This episode was mixed and scored by Zach Schmidt. Production assistance from Tom Cody. Our editor is Wendy Daw, and our creative director is Nazanin Rasanjani. Our theme song was composed by Bobby Lord and Matthew Ball. Special thanks to all the real world cast and crew members we spoke to for this episode, including Andre Como, Eric Nice, John Brennan, Pam Ling, and Adam Beckman. Music for this episode is courtesy of West One Music, audio from the real world by Bunim Murray Productions. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe to The Venture on Apple Podcasts or whichever app you use to listen and leave us a review. It really does help people find our show. To learn more, go to virginatlantic.com slash The Venture. Next time on The Venture, we meet the original creators of fake news, The Onion. They had been planning uh, with issue three to take a photo of the two of them mooning the camera and printing it on the cover of issue three with the big banner headline that said, F*** you readers, we quit. That's next time on The Venture. I'm Ashley Milne-Tite. Thanks for listening.